you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Did you ever blood dope or use blood transfusions to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. <laughs> Shut up, legs. <laughs> hey guys, this is Faster U4 brought to you by FitLab, Tailwind Nutrition, Biomax, and Capital Cycles. If you're a cyclist, you want to go faster? It is giddy up. Yo guys, Steve here, how are you going? Nice to see you, thanks for watching. Welcome to another episode of Fast You Fall. Hey, uh, so, today I'm uh, having a little spin here. Uh, and I'd like to talk about what happened on the weekend race. Uh, and stuff I learned. So I'm gonna... So I'll bring it up here in Strava. Let's talk through the race. Uh, let's talk about what happened, what I learned. Uh, so it's going to be one of those sorts of discussions today. Um, if you find that really boring, don't watch this one. But I'll talk about the tactics of how it played out. I got beat. I got beat bad. I didn't get beat too bad, I didn't get it right. But I'm going to talk about what happened as a very specific set of events that happens in road racing. It happened to me on the weekend. It beat me. And it kind of explains the power of tactics um, which no matter how strong you are and it's not like I'm riding super strong at the moment but it can can so easily beat you so I'll talk through that how you can use that too and how it was used on me again I'll try to keep this down a little bit so on the weekend we had the um, Wellington Masters Club road race champs so uh, map down here a uh, little uh, counterclockwise circuit just out of Martinborough. Um, so I'm sort of rising the first, oh, so that, that there's the thing about having a Garmin is the elevation profile can be out a little bit because the temperature changes over time. It affects the sensor. But basically in the first, so that you can see that happening there. But it will give you the guts of it. The first half of the course is some rollers. There's a decent climb uh, called Miller's Road halfway through course um, and there and that's about so that's a climb of about it's the main feature that's a climb of about uh, uh, about two, one and a half to two minutes super power climb and that's where in the end uh, things played out so uh, what I've got there two laps total of 94.5 kilometers uh, let's go through stats for the race um, we had a normalized power there of 315 watts, which is pretty high. Um, I'm 80 kilos, so even for a guy like me, that's quite a high normalized power figure. And that was because quite early we had some action, we were working, doing work as a relatively small group for a lot of the race. Uh, so the normalized power was quite high in this race. Uh, cadence 95, it's a good zone to be in reasonably good reservation of muscle glycogen that 95 to 100 range for a long-ish race here it's only 2 hours 26 but uh, it's quite long for a club race here um, average 38.7k an hour uh, which is pretty good so uh, I've got it to a maximum heart rate um, 174 beats so I was at average freshness, probably. You know, it's checking your maximum heart rate in a race is quite a good indication of freshness sometimes because you can pretty much guarantee just about any race you do, you will at some point reach your maximum heart rate. Um, I find that super fresh, 178, 179 beats. Super fatigued, maybe 10 beats lower than that will be my max out. Somewhere in the middle. In terms of freshness, so that's fine. Maximum power, 1,011 watts. About normal for me. 
So let's take a look at what happened in the race, uh, the main players, and tactics that played out. Screwed me over. And good for them too. So, uh, start out at 9 o'clock. The format, mass start road race. I mean, uh, maybe it's just worth talking about that for, for a second. Mass start kind of speaks for itself. All of the people, no matter what their ability, who are doing the same course, start in one group. That's different to a graded race, where you'd have A, B, C, D. Or something like a handicap, where you have scratch, break, uh, and limit groups. Uh, so this is a mass start, everyone on the road together. And the reason that that changes how you might look at how it's going to go is you need to be quite near the front at a mass start race to make sure that if festivities start relatively early, as they did in this case, you are able to stay with the front riders and not miss a break. Because there's lots of guys who are of lower ability nearby and around, you don't want to be behind a bunch of them when fireworks happen. So be aware of riders you're marking that are good. Uh, have them in mind, be near them. Don't get too far near the back. Stay in the front third. And as it happened, and if I bring up the analysis, you can probably almost see how it did play out at the start. If I'm looking down here at the graph of the heart rate and things, you can see after only about what is that, uh, 5Ks, things really kicked off and you can see from my heart rate that uh, things got going. So on one of the first small rises of the race, uh, John Randall went off the front. He was immediately covered by Brendan McGrath and myself. And then uh, Hope Buke and Lee Campbell came across as well. So it was a good group of some of five of about the strongest guys there. So it was great. It was very hard. And in fact, in that, that surge to get across, it was so important to be on that that I put out my best ever power curve for that, for that jump. So that was maybe a 30 second to a minute burst of power to make sure I was in that group. The guys, other guys were off our wheel. That was a record for me. Something like 650 to 700 watts for about a minute, which is pretty chunky. And you can see there, you can even just probably zoom in on it a bit. That may have even been towards my maximum heart rate. You can see a burst of power there. It's getting over the brake, over to the brake. Uh, it's I'll probably even highlight that burst there. See it comes down 900, uh, 818 watts, about 15 seconds. That was about half of it. The wattage reduced a little after that. So somewhere around about the 650 to 700 watt mark for about a minute. But that was that's important to be in because if it's a mass start, lots of lower grade riders won't be able to bridge and you're away. And we were. So for the remainder of the next three quarters, uh, for about half of the race, we all lapped it out pretty good. And um, you can see the power there is very consistent. Um, and about halfway to three quarters of the way, a couple of the weaker rider in the group got unhooked, who was Hope Buke, he did a great job. Uh, then uh, soon after that, Lee got unhooked from the pain train. Uh, but he'd done a great job too. He had a little bit of inattention on his part, led to him uh, not noticing that there was a bit of a surge on a small climb. He went off the back and won against three is uh, always going to be a guess sentence. So he had a time trial by himself for the rest of the race. Um, for that first part of the race, for about 20 kilometers, Brendan McGrath uh, was off the front by himself about uh, 20 seconds in front, 20 to 30 seconds, and we held him there on the basis that he was probably the strongest of us, and uh, we wanted to let him burn his matches somewhat. But he's so strong that that's not 
not necessarily always a great idea because you can go away, but we held them. So uh, the good idea there is to make sure that the people who you're with are willing to work and come through, not at a huge pace, about threshold power under it, a little under it when you come through on your turns. That'll ensure you're not getting any matches, but traveling as a group, the air resistance is divided and you travel faster for the same energy on an individual basis as you would on your own. That's why if you're in a group of three or something, as long as you keep that person inside and they're by themselves, you would have to be a superstar to stay away. Brennan eventually decided to sit up. Now, the thing that happened next was, I didn't know whether I should let him just get back on the group or not. I decided not to. I don't know if it's a dick move or not. Um, well, as soon as we caught him, I basically splintered off the front and tried to make it so that there would be a very difficult chase for him to get back on. I think one or two of the other guys more or less set up and let him get back on, which is totally fine. Um, I tried to trial by myself for a couple of minutes, but knew that I was going to be in the same position as Brendan was, so I just let him bring me back, which was fine. Ah, uh, sorry Brendan, if that was a dick move. I don't think it terribly was because if you'd done the same to me, I think that's just bike racing. Uh, you totally paid me back anyway. So, the thing that happened uh, after that was, and where it sort of got quite fruity, final third of the race, uh, we, uh, Brendan went away again, so we've dropped Hope, we've dropped Lee, me, John, and Brendan, bottom of, or near the bottom of this second time over the main climb, Brendan went away, had about 30 seconds on us. Um, the reason that came about was the central, uh, the way that came about was the central um, tactical issue that meant I couldn't hold on. So let's just talk about what happened there. Why did Brendan get to get away? Well, what happened was a move, I've heard it called various things, but it's a tactic that people normally refer to as the one-two. So, let's work through it. Say so you've got three guys situation like we did. Two of those guys are working together. If you watch, actually, if you want to see a really good example of this in a slightly bigger format, uh, watch Perry Rube 2001, I think it was, uh, where you have, what's 2001? Around about there, maybe 02, where you have a bunch of, uh, could be a farm fritz riders, I think, a domo, something like that, and they would work together. The way you do that is, say one of the riders who is working attacks, goes up the road, it can be anywhere, but preferably on a little roller. That means that the person who doesn't have a teammate has to chase on to his wheel. Of course, the person who's in the team, if the guy who's off the front can sit on your wheel, get drafted all the way up, and very near to when you get hooked on to the guy's wheel, the guy who's on your wheel goes. So he goes. Of course, you don't have any option but to chase again because you're working as a team, and so on. And it's a very short matter of time before I lasted one or two of those attacks before I was completely just breathing out my ears on the rivet uh, and just gone. And I, and I think you'll probably see here, it's around about this phase here, but this zoom in along here, a couple of, it's a very big, well, very big effort there, very big effort here, very big effort here, 30 second to one minute efforts very high power. I think that was my last one there. It's getting later in the race, so I'm a little bit tired. Getting up to mid 160s BPM, 416 watts for a minute and a half, which at that stage in the race is quite a strong effort. I did catch on, then Brendan went again, and I couldn't anymore. So you can see about three quarters of the way through the race there. Brendan got about 30 seconds on us for that. We used that, that tactic which is good, good for them, he was working with John. Uh, and then, on the uh, the second thing that happened to sort of round out the remainder of the race was, at the bottom or near the bottom of the uh, final main climb, uh, 
I was working on the front with John on my wheel to try to bring back Brenda if possible. It's unlikely, but it's all you can do. Um, and John, fair and square, put the paint on up the uh, climb and just rode me off his wheel. Um, simple as that. In fact, that effort I looked at may have been that effort. Uh, let's see here, let's look at the climb. If I get this, the uh, segment here, you can see it's a good strong effort. Up Miller's we averaged 361 watts, get a bit tired, heart rate going up. About halfway up there, uh, I put on a lot of power, 500 watts or so, mid 500s, but it fell away 400s, even 300s when I could see. John rode me off his wheel, it's right down, just absolutely the best possible position I could be in. Nice and upright, developing all the power I could. Not too worried about Euro because it's on a climb. Couldn't develop any more power. His power to weight was superior. So he um, ended up opening about 20 to 30 seconds on me. This is John. So we have a situation where we're in the final 20 k's of the race. Brendan has a lead of about 30 seconds uh, in front of John. And he has about 30 seconds on me. So I'll show you, that's how it finished. I'll show you an interesting thing that happened at the end. John and I are very similar uh, ability in terms of time trialing. We're always very close to each other. He's a bigger guy, he has more power. I'm a slightly smaller guy, less power, better aero. So that's how it's kind of, how it kind of washes out. So if we look at this last sector here in Strava, it's actually great because that sector there was exactly the sector where he had a 30 second lead on me and I was chasing and I thought to myself I wonder how closely matched we actually were it's a situation where it's essentially an individual pursuit it's funny as we were racing I was thinking about it well in this individual pursuit you can go and have a look here in the feature where it says compare and you can look at yesterday's ride if I just filter this by say this month so here's me and John there, two top top times there so let's have a look if I just delete an older or the one from earlier in the day all right let's look at how we compare now you can see there on the lines the black line represents my speed or position relative to John's in the purple now you can see that the purple line is a little over and a little under all the time. But to put in perspective how close you actually were, this segment there is over 18, it's probably about 19 kilometers long. So that's, um, in terms of time, that must have been about 20 minutes worth of riding. 20 to 25 minutes worth. He is not in with me, so we're not together. It's 30 seconds up the road. To show how evenly matched we are, we're both trying to catch each other in a pursuit. You can see that basically along the whole way, one second, one second, one second, one second, we're within one second of each other the entire 25 or so minutes. The maximum that that blew out to was two seconds here for a, for a brief period. Uh, for a brief period he was two seconds behind me and then back to one second. Those details are so small that it could almost be that the satellite uh, is just not, that the system just isn't granular enough and sophisticated enough to keep up with that. So you, you, you wouldn't really know whether it's a second, I was a second up, he was a second up, you wouldn't really know. So that's a pretty good example where even though we're not riding together, we're so evenly matched. If you put us down uh, in that period, we're, we're almost exactly matched. To give you an idea of Aero, I was talking about where he's a guy, an example of a person where he's a bigger person, he's bigger more power, but the aerodynamics of a smaller person is slightly better. When I say small, you know, I mean giant by pro cycling standards, but uh, so if we look at the power there, on that sector, I averaged 292 watts. On that same sector, John Randall averaged 
it was about, from memory, let's have a look at what it actually was, 301 watts. So about 10 watts, when I say two, uh, yeah, so my best time there was 220, uh, so yeah, when I say 261 watts, 301, so 40 watts difference for exactly the same time. So I was putting out 40 watts less than him, which is pretty big, you know, well over 10%. Somewhere about 15% higher power he put out. You can see Aero Drag of a larger person, slightly larger. Uh, that's the main reason. Bikes and equipment, very much the same. So I don't think there's much to be gained there. Most of it is Aero Drag in the position. So there you go, 40 watts, 43 watts from, from that. That's how it played out. Came into the final turns. First, second, third. Brendan McGrath. John Randall and me, Billy came in for a fine fourth for Lab Rider. So that's the race, uh, I'll cut it off here. I would like to just say one thing, which is a huge welcome back to bike racing for one Stephen Artu O'Keefe. For those of you who don't know, Stephen was completely pummeled by a car on a Norwegian Bay about four months ago. Coming into some great form, unfortunately. He got it. Complete smashing and was in a wheelchair for about ooh, 9, 10, 11 weeks, maybe 12. Massive fractures in his pelvis area and his spine. This was his first ride back since then. And he rode like a complete savage. Finished the race, which is a, a massive thing in itself. Well, it did very well. It's really interesting to see someone come back with some targeted endurance training. No, it's not fun, but it's just effective because his endurance has come back well. Top end needs some work. Uh, but I'd just like to say, congratulations, buddy. It's great to see you back. All right, I'll call it a day there. Thanks for watching. As always, this is brought to you by Philab, Tailwind Nutrition, by Maxa Capital Cycles. If you'd like a coaching plan from me, please do get in touch. You can email me on stephenfitlab.co.nz. You can go through our website, look at all the cool photos, uh, check out who we are. Me, Andrew Jamison, who are on the show. Uh, Fitlab.co.nz Thanks for watching slash listening to Fast You Fall, brought to you by Fitlab, Capital Cycles, Tailwind Nutrition, and Biomexa. If you'd like to get in touch for a good tune program or testing, you can get hold of me, Steve, at fitlab.co.nz, or go to fitlab.co.nz.